So I had some guys ask over the weekend a little bit more about vibrant clamps, where you can use them, how they actually work, and all that stuff. We, I wouldn't do anything but vibrant clamps. I really like them. They give you a good range of movement. You do have to pay some attention uh, as to how you fab them up. Definitely don't want to put a V-band on one end and a vibrant clamp on the other end if you have flexible mounts because you're still going to put that pipe in a bind. So really I recommend putting a vibrant clamp on both ends of a pipe if you're going to do one end. As far as how a vibrant clamp works, it's not like your typical V-band clamp. It has a couple of different components to you. I'll take this apart well here. Let me show you first how much movement. So this clamp currently, I don't have any O-rings in it, so it moves a little bit more freely than what it does once there's O-rings in it, but it doesn't really change the range of motion any. But you can see here, this pipe can move quite a bit. So there's maybe about a quarter inch of in and out movement, and then there's 12 degrees of up and down movement. So if you would fab this pipe to where it's in a bind already, it does have its range of motion, so you need to pay attention and make sure you keep things fairly squared up when you're doing your fabricating. But if you get that thing in the middle of its range, you can get a lot of movement out of it. So I'll take the clamp apart and show you how it works. This is the main clamshell. Um, it's just pretty simple, has two lips on the edge of it. And then this is the sealing ring. And then there's the two main flanges here. Um, about two flanges here with o-rings in them they make these flanges in either aluminum or stainless and you can mix and match them so if you have an aluminum intercooler and have stainless piping you can put an aluminum on the one side and a stainless on the other then the o-rings sit inside of those grooves and then those ride this is two different sizes so it's not really a good example but um, that sealing ring sits on top of the o-rings and then the clamshell traps those lips inside of the clamshell so really strong we've run these on pretty much all of our race trucks uh, we had them on the pro street truck when we were making about 170 to 180 pounds of boost with the triples had no problems with them there we've got them on daily drivers uh, I've never seen any of the HD clamps broken unless they were in a bind. Um, we have broken one, but that was on a big truck situation where we had things get in a bind and it eventually broke the lip. But we put them through a lot of abuse. Uh, boost checking, I feel like they're really tight. You do need to pay some attention to the O-rings. They sell some different O-rings depending on um, what uh, style or what material your flanges are but if you use the o-ring that come with it or if you use a replacement make sure you get the same color o-ring but other than that they're pretty simple straightforward um, we'd be glad to help you with any questions you have or help you find parts the all of the vibrant clamp kits come with only aluminum flanges so if you buy a full kit you're going to get aluminum flanges uh, but if you go to vibrant's website you can buy all of the individual pieces where if you want to do one with aluminum on one side and stainless on the other you can piece the uh, whole clamp together that way you know buying individual pieces or if you're doing an all stainless clamp you also need to piece those together as well so once again if you need any help with that we'd be glad to help you I had a few questions from guys regarding our four link kit uh, just some, you know, what sizes does everything accommodate? How do you set stuff up? Some different stuff like that. So we've got a four link kit here that we're just starting on on uh, Stuart Ingraham's truck. And it's a little bit of a different setup because it's a, well, it's a Ford chassis for one. So things are a little bit different with that. And then it's also, it's a full quad cab. So the cab is a lot longer than what we're usually dealing with, which in turn makes the back half shorter. So the four link brackets in relation to the frame here is a lot closer than what we often see. Uh, if we get a truck here in the shop in the next month or two where we have a little bit more typical uh, size configuration, I'll, I'll try to show you that as well. But I'm just gonna go over some of the basics of how we try to set up these four links uh, just to give you a starting platform. Both the upper notch and the lower notch on the front bracket are notched for inch and 5 eighths tubing. So, Pretty much if you want to build to the front brackets, you're going to want to use inch and 5 eighths pipe, whether you're using mild steel or chromoly. 
thing, first thing you need to do is get your axle clean. Get all of your old uh, spring mounts, shock mounts, anything like that. Get it all stripped off, get the axle cleaned up. Once you have that done, then you need to figure out approximately what pinion angle uh, you want the axle to be at. Generally, you want the pinion pretty much pointing at the tail shaft of your transmission. So get that set in place, figure out what angle the pinion is at in relation to zero. Once you have that set, then you can go ahead and weld on the rear four link bars, or sorry, the rear four link brackets. So you just want to weld those on at, you know, perfectly vertical. So I have a digital angle finder. I find that makes things really easy. Um, so just, you know, if your pinion angle is at five degrees, set it at five degrees and weld your brackets on vertically. Uh, once you have the rear brackets welded, and the other thing, the other thing that I really like to do with that is bolt your rear brackets together uh, with the rod ends in place. That way, you for sure get the proper width, um, and it keeps those really, you know, stable and where you need to have them. Um, also, with having two bends on your axle you're not able to slide the brackets on, so I'll actually cut them in half, and then before I actually weld them to the axle, I'll put them you know, around the axle and tack them back together to where they're in one piece, and then once you have them back in one piece, you can position them how you need them, and uh, you know, get a good tack on those at least before you move on with that. Then once you have the rear brackets in place, uh, we like to move on to the front brackets. Uh, when you're doing a complete back half, I like to weld in the top and the bottom crossbars, get everything squared up really well, get everything trued up, uh, and get all those bars welded in. And then once you have that in place, you can go ahead and bolt in your four link bars. Doesn't really matter what hole position you go on the four link bars at this point. Uh, there's a lot of adjustment there. You can adjust that all down the road. But when you're positioning the front four link brackets, you want to have the bottom of the bracket the same height as the bottom of the axle four link bracket. So pretty much just make those level. If you can't get them perfect, it's not the end of the world, but that's where you're going to have your best range of adjustment. Um, so that seems to work really well for us. But overall, you know, just check and double check, make sure all your widths are where you need them and keep everything square. Keep in mind it's really easy to pull things uh, with the heat of a welder. So tack things really well and then double check things and, and keep checking your work as you move through because it's really easy to get in a pickle if you're not paying attention to that kind of stuff. Weld it up and in place like you see here. Then you're able to get all your measurements and start building pipes to that. Uh, it's going to vary a lot depending on your frame and your height of your chassis and all that different stuff. So. There's no one way of doing it. A lot of it's common sense. Make sure you have really good cross bracing if you're doing a complete back half. If you're doing a factory frame uh, four length, you don't have to have near as much bracing because you already have a good sturdy frame there, but there's still, you need to make sure that you have good structure in there. Get corner gussets, just pay attention to, to all of that kind of stuff. Once again, that's gonna somewhat depend on your chassis as to how long that bar is going to be. You want to have the track bar, you want to make it as long as you possibly can, and you also want to set it as close to level as possible. That way, if you move just the way that an arch works, you know, if you're way out of level, you're going to get a lot more side to side movement of the axle than what you would when you're really close to level when your suspension is compressing and extending. The other thing that's going to vary some in our four link kits is we offer an integrated shock mount where on the axle brackets we offer a bracket that has adjustable holes in it to where our lower shock mounts will bolt to. Or the other thing that we offer is just a standalone shock mount bracket. Oftentimes on a factory frame four link we'll go with the independent shock mount because then you can mount those inside of the frame, whereas your four link brackets are outside of the frame. But usually when we do a full back half, we'll end up using the integrated shock mount where the shock will end up mounting right behind your four link brackets and then it will run up to your back half frame. So, and some of that is also up to how you want to do it. So just specify that 
as to when you're ordering your kit. Um, usually, if we know that it's going to be a factory frame, we automatically send the separate brackets. If we know that it's going to be a full back half, we'll send the integrated brackets. So this is the adjustable part of the lower shock mount. The shock goes in here. This sandwich is on both sides of the mount. So pretty much we just have, there's quite a few adjustment holes there. You've got, I don't know, I think about six inches of up and down adjustment. This is our independent shock mount that you can just weld it anywhere you need on the axle. And then this is our integrated shock mount that is a part of the four link bracket. So pretty much it's your choice. This is what we like to use in a full back half most of the time. And then most of the time when we're doing the factory frame four link, these work out better so that you can keep your shocks inside of the frame rail and keep your four link brackets outside of the frame rail in place of the factory leaf springs. One of the other th questions that gets asked a lot is where do I set my bars? That's going to change some on every truck depending on weight biases, depending on what you're doing, whether you're four wheel drive, whether you're two wheel drive, all that different kind of stuff. One of the best answers I can give you is study up. There's four links aren't magic. They give you the ability to move where you're applying force to your vehicle. One of the most helpful things for me was to get the book called Door Slammers. It's a book that you can buy on Amazon, Jag, Summit, most any place like that carries it. It's really insightful, just kind of teaching you the basics of what you're doing with your four link. At some point I may do a video going a little bit more in depth on some of that stuff, but really a lot of it, if you can learn it for yourself, you're gonna be miles ahead rather than just doing what somebody tells you. If you can understand how that stuff works, it makes a big difference. If you buy a kit from us, I'll gladly kind of help you with some initial setup. It's a little bit hard for me to keep up with all of the questions sometimes, but I'll do the best I can if you want to send us a message and we'll help you, you know, help get you started and point in the right direction.